So I'm super excited to have our next guest on because George Arison uh, is the founder of Shift, Shift.com. We're going to talk about that and the company uh, going public via a SPAC. There's been a lot of spectacular companies going public, and we're going to talk about the whole SPAC movement, which everybody's very interested in. But in addition, George created Uber years before Uber existed or Lyft with something called Taxi Magic. So we're going to get into the history of that and what it's like as a founder to create a game-changing company, but not win the big prize. Welcome to the pod, George Arison. And I'm pronouncing it correct. It's Arison, A-R-I-S-O-N, correct? That's correct. And thanks for having me. Excited to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I let off with it. It's got to be an interesting moment. A lot of your friends probably bring this up and family members. You created Taxi Magic, which, if my memory serves me correct, was a way to get a taxi and have it dispatched. Uh, sounds very familiar to me. And you did that back in 2007, which was a couple of years before Uber existed, correct? Yeah, we uh, started Taxi Magic in February of 2007. And, um, you know, launched it uh, as a product first on the East Coast and then in San Francisco as well. You could book a taxi to come to you through your phone. At this point, it was a BlackBerry and a uh, you know, Palm device, Windows Mobile. iPhone did not yet exist. Uh, and then you could also pay for the taxi through the phone as well all connected to the dispatch systems at the taxi fleets. Which I was, didn't realize you also had payments because yep. that was Uber's uh, and Lyft's big innovation as well. But you did it with taxis, not with Lincoln Town Cars. Take me back to that decision to do taxis and not Lincoln Town Cars. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, we actually did Lincoln Town Cars in New York, but the thinking was we wanted to appeal to the broadest segment of the population and taxis made a lot of sense. The concept for the business came out of B2B use, actually. It was for business travelers first, and they would not want black cars, right? The travel manager would want to limit what you spend, and the idea was to kind of have you do taxis rather than black yes. cars. That was kind of part of the concept. Um, and, you know, we we came up with a lot of great tech and my co-founder and now my co-CEO at Shift, um, Toby Russell, calls it the you know Netscape of the uh, automotive on-demand space because we came up with a product and then obviously others won, uh, which mm -hmm. is fine. We still learned a ton and it was a really great experience. But for us, the really big uh, kind of challenge came when um, Lehman Brothers went under, actually, because we uh, Lehman Brothers was going to be our first uh, New York customer uh, with all the black cars in New York kind of using right. our tech to, to do the pickup from the bank and take you home at night um, product, uh, which was very popular. You know, you, back in the day, a lot of black cars were circling uh, the banks uh, to pick people up. Yeah, if you lived and in New York, you saw uh, down from any major high price building, Class A office space, whether it was Goldman Sachs or, yeah. you know... Um, a uh, famous law firm or Sherman Sterling or something, there would just be tons and tons of Lincoln Town Cars circling to take people yep. home for a hundred bucks a pop to Brooklyn. Exactly. Uh, yep, that's to, exactly right. And so we were going to be managing that for, for Lehman Brothers. And then of, like literally we signed the contract to do that about two weeks before they went under. Wow. Um, so that really kind of messed the New York plan up. But we were going to do black cars in a much more aggressive way in addition to taxis in New York in particular. Um, but, you know, I think the really big problem for us was the fact that we never gave a product away for free. Um, ah. Like the the team uh, at its core, and in particular, our co-founder, um, Tom DePasquale, who's a super amazing uh, businessman, but he had done a bunch of enterprise businesses. And mm -hmm. so he really believed in the notion that, hey, you got to charge um, for everything right off the bat. Wow. And that was a, a mistake that we made. We should have gone freemium, offered the product for free, yep. gotten a bunch of users, and then kind of... So um, that throttled your growth because people didn't even exactly. know you existed. And the only way they would know you existed if they gave you money. So there's a exactly. huge lesson yep. learned. Exactly. And, and then, then what's it? What's it? Okay, continue. He, here's the really crazy part. So um, Bill Gurley found us um, yeah. through um, Michael, uh, sorry, through Adam Dell, Michael Dell's brother. Of course. Of course, uh, I knew Adam when I lived in New York. I'd see him at Bungalow yeah. 8 at 3 so, in the morning. Yeah. So he found us, and then he uh, told Bill Gurley about it. Bill wow. Gurley kind of started to get really interested. This is all like way before Uber is even around. And um, he really wanted to do a, a round of funding and shift. And uh, ultimately, Tom, our you know leader as Wait, a founder... No, Ta and, so um, in, 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 in uh, Taxi Magic. Taxi and, Magic. Uh, Tom really didn't want to do that because he... Um, 
uh, you know, he, he, they disagreed on this kind of consumer freemium versus enterprise wow. ap- approach. So, uh, you know, we, so it's even of- worse than not hitting it. You literally have the guy who did yep. the Series A and Uber would have given you the money. One of the 10 greatest venture capitalists in yep. the history of venture capital was on your doorstep. And because of your co-founder not agreeing with him about something Bill Gurley was clearly right about and yep. you well, understand now it killed I was the deal in the middle between the, yes that's exactly right and it was a oh you know God. probably cost me personally like hundreds of millions of dollars no and, no and, billions and, and maybe billions well you were a co-founder <laughs> of the company yeah yes so i mean he, i mean if you're a co-founder with 10 percent, uber's worth 65 billion right now i'm gonna say even if you got diluted down to two percent you would be worth 1.2 billion dollars right now Yep. So it was a oh my tough, Lord. tough, tough process. But anyway, oh you know, look, I uh, you know what I think about that sometimes because I could have put fifty k instead of twenty five k into Uber, and then you know what I did? I looked myself in the mirror and said, "Don't get greedy. Get back yep. to work. That, that, Don't worry. Don't sweat the small stuff." I I agree. And look, I think um, I learned a ton at Taxi Magic, and we built a great company, uh, even though we made oh. a ton of mistakes. And uh, you know, I'm taking a lot of those Betty. learnings and doing things differently now. Everybody who you know says you could have built Uber. What's that like at Christmas or whatever? You know, New Year's Eve. <laughs> that was asked, that was asked a lot more back oh, in the day before gotcha. a kind of yeah. shift was you know fully humming. Today, not that many people ask that anymore. Um, I think for us, to be honest, uh, beyond that specific mistake, not being in in the valley uh, got in the way as well because oh. we were based in Virginia and. Um, that really kind of the mentality of like enterprise only don't give away for free, et cetera. Back then was very much like only in Silicon Valley was that a thing. So you, Uh, the people, you weren't bold. Basically East coast companies at the time were very conservative. They were think, and the VCs on the East coast with some notable exceptions like Fred Wilson were so uh, exactly. obsessed with downside protection and not losing their money that they didn't swing for the fences, did they? Yep, that's exactly right. So I think that, you know, kind of even before Gurley, like we should have thought about moving the company out to San Francisco and or mm. Bay Area. As somebody from the former Soviet Union, and you look at America today, and you see a contingent of people, I put it in the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, New York Times, uh, anti-capitalist, ban the billionaires, capitalism is bad. Uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon are horrible because they're successful. When you look at this as somebody coming from Russia who had to fight for every inch of your existence, I am certain, to get here and your father, the maniac he was, demanding you learn English to have a better life. What do you think when you look at the last couple of years and the anti-capitalism, the pro-socialism, ban the billionaires movement in America, even though I know it's a small contingent, what do you think, honestly, as somebody from Georgia and the firm or server USSR, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think Bernie Sanders is nuts, uh, even though I went to college in Vermont. And well, I guess maybe because I went to college in Vermont, I knew about Bernie Sanders before anybody else knew about Bernie right. Sanders. Uh, look, America is the most amazing place in the world. Nowhere else w- could you do what I did, right? Like I'm a gay kid born in the Soviet Union. I now live in Palo Alto with a husband and two children and, and, and built uh, two companies in my life. That's not possible anywhere else. This is the most amazing experiment in the history of mankind. And we have to do everything we can to protect it because uh, we've been left by our forefathers with an incredible gift. And uh, we need to ensure that it's there for the future generations. And I don't think that uh, going the socialist route, socialism route kind of helps you do that. Uh, I think capitalism and Republican government are very intertwined. Um, free trade is obviously critical to that as well. And I love politics uh, in part because I want to make sure that uh, our system of government perpetuates because it is the most incredible system of government we've ever um, had before. When you look at, you know, sort of the interference from the Russians and Putin specifically, what what is he sitting there laughing at us that he's been able to find our two weaknesses? I mean, really, if you think about America's weaknesses, uh, one is the the terrible uh, racial history of this country and the scar we have from slavery, our original sin here, and uh, the indigenous people here getting rolled over and taking their land. That is one really sore spot that we need to resolve. And then you have the second sore spot, which is the polarization of wealth, which 
you know, if you're in Russia, you know, if, if you get wealthy, <laughs> Putin just takes half your money. And, or you run away. Or you run. <laughs> so w when, you, when you look at his interfering here and the, and the, and the, the collapse, essentially, Russia is becoming irrelevant, oil is becoming irrelevant. What are your thoughts on the, the interference and how America has basically fallen for this hook, line, and sinker? Well, he's been, or Russians have been interfering in elections in its neighboring countries forever, right? In Georgia, they interfere all the time. In the Baltics, they try to interfere all the time. So it's not per se like surprising that Russia interferes in elections. I think we've let him kind of do it. Uh, I think there's a problem in both parties, frankly, that we can't really talk to each other about uh, some fundamental issues. I mean, politics should, should end at the water's edge and, and we should be able to... Uh, have a unified foreign policy, right? Even if we disagree on what the approach should be. Uh, and we've been, you know, making mistakes on that front for a long time. I, I, know, I I'm kind of the mind that, you know, this election is going to be what it is. But ultimately, um, both political parties, uh, especially younger people in both political parties have to step up and, and figure out what we're going to do about governing ourselves in a better way. Because what we've been doing for the last you know, 12 to 15, 20 years is not really working. And by the way, it's not about like, oh, things are going to be bad in the United States. If things are bad in the United States, things are going to be really crappy everywhere else in the world. Um, and See, so this is a very important observation for young people listening to this podcast who are entitled and have been coddled in America their entire lives, which is, if America is not exceptional, and we're exceptional through capitalism and through creating products. That's how we are exceptional in the world is the freedoms we have to create the world's dominant companies that spread around the world, whether it's Google or Uber or Tesla. We need these companies. We need to lead economically and we need to lead on human rights uh, and, and on having a just system here. And if we don't, well, then despots and, you know, whether it's MBS in Saudi Arabia or Xi Jinping in China or Putin in Russia or the Kim Jongs in North Korea, this is bad for humanity yep. and human rights globally. Yep. And generally speaking, when a you know, world system that's kind of running well falls apart, it's usually followed by centuries of mass kind of chaos for the world. Yeah. And that's really bad. So I think that uh, we have a lot of obligations uh, to the world and to ourselves and to our children, right? So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, but that said, I'm super hopeful, right? Like we uh, figure things out uh, in America and when we do, uh, we tend to do them really, really well. Uh, and I'm very confident that we'll do this uh, in this case as well. I'm really excited today to have one of my great friends, colleagues, uh, and co-conspirators on the podcast. He's been on now, if my memory serves me correctly, four times in 10 years, and this is the fifth. He's on every two or three years, uh, episode 25, episode 279, episode 429 in 2014, episode 674 in 2016, and you know what? Four years between appearances is way too long for a gap with getting Mark Schuster on the podcast. My mistake, the problem is, we're on a board of density together and we get to see each other all the time. And I forgot the point of this pod is for you to get to listen in to me having conversations with the smartest, most driven entrepreneurs, capitalist thinkers in the space. And one of those is my good friend, Mark Suster. Welcome back to the pod for a fifth time. Thank you, Jason. You know, I should say also, we used to produce a show together called This yes. Week in Venture Capital, which was fun right. to do. It was fun to do, but you were too busy being a venture capitalist to do it consistently. <laughs> uh, and uh, But I've been doing this now. Gosh, it's so crazy. You were on the 25th. Can you believe now over a thousand episodes since you've been on? Amazing. Uh, what does sustainability mean in the lens of investing specifically in companies? What is a sustainable company? What does that mean? That they use paper cups and paper straws? Or does it mean they have a product that, you know, uh, is, you know, creating paper cups and straws in the industry? Explain. The hard thing about being an investor is we have to invest in where we think the market is going to be five to seven years from now. Yep. If we invest in things that are going to be big 15 years from now, it doesn't matter if we're right. Uh, being too early is the same as being wrong. So we have to be in a five to seven year cycle. Uh, usually, if I'm talking about something to my investors, my LPs, um, I say to them, if my idea is obvious to you and you're nodding your head, I probably missed the idea. So I want to make you slightly uncomfortable because I want to be investing in things that you don't buy into today. And then the other hard thing is you not only have to be right about the category, you have to pick the right team. 
So I was very early in text messaging and free text messaging being a service. And I had a thesis because I lived in Europe when Skype grew. Uh, and I backed a team that was incredibly talented. They just weren't WhatsApp. So we had, you know, tens of millions of users very early on. It was called Text Plus. They had, you know, built and sold and IPO'd a company before. Uh, we just didn't end up being the winner. Now, sustainability. In 2013, my partner Eve Cicerone and I started saying we need to invest in companies that are solving our long-term water crisis. We need to solve our long-term water crisis means we need to solve agriculture because there's way more water wasted in agriculture than is wasted in your toilet or your shower. And so we took three bets in the category. Uh, one, all of them were like half a million dollar bets and then we followed them. One of them was appeal sciences. And what they did is they took the waste products of uh, fruit and vegetable and they create an organic compound that seals in moisture and prevents oxidation without herbicides and pesticides. And if you want to have an impact on water, you have to solve agriculture. About 45% of all agriculture in the United States is spoiled before it's eaten. About 70% in the developing world. And so really, we wanted to impact how long your fruit and veg last. And, and so the ability to take avocados and have avocados last 30 days longer is massive. And what the impact has been is avocado wastage before it's sold in retail has gone from about 10% down to about 2% in the retailers that use us. In citrus products, wastage has gone from 6 to 7% to less than 1% before it's sold. And then once it gets to the consumer's house, uh, a lot less is getting thrown in the garbage bin and is getting eaten by people. Um, so that saves money and is increasing revenue because if you go to a grocer to buy avocados and you only buy two or three, now suddenly you can buy five or six. So we saw sales go up more than 40% in the grocers that were using Appeal. So we're now being rolled out across the largest grocer in Germany called Etica the largest grocer in the United States, which is Kroger. And it's an invisible plant-based seal, just to be clear. It's not plastic. This is a plant-based seal that goes on an avocado, just makes it last longer. 100% organic, FDA approved. I'll give you another example, cucumbers. Mm. So you notice sometimes you go to the grocery store, they have plastic on them. Oh, that's, but that, that's to preserve it because mm. otherwise it doesn't last very long. So Walmart, sorry, Walmart... Uh, yeah, Walmart has announced um, that they're going to standardize on appeal for all cucumbers and get rid of all plastic. So that's one example. I want to give you a second, Jason, if you don't mind. Yeah, I know it's a little course. bit long-winded. We've invested in a company that nobody on this call has heard of. Okay. It's called Insect. Okay. It starts, Insect. Yeah. It starts with a Y, not an I. Okay. What they do is they figured out how to grow industrial-scale worms. And what they do is they grow in vertical farms. It uses 97% less uh, carbon than you would if you grew it in a horizontal manner. Um, it actually has a negative carbon footprint. And we use robots to grow them. So we stack containers. The robot goes in, lifts it up, feeds the worm, drops it, goes in, feeds the next worm, drop it. Now, why does any of this matter? What happened was we were depleting the world's stock of fish. We were pulling sardines and anchovies out of the population and feeding them as part of fish meal to other fish. And that was causing a problem in terms of sustainability of fish stock. So what fish growers did is they started feeding them carbohydrates. But it turns out a lot, of, a lot of fish can't digest carbohydrates, so fish mortality went up. So they started using antibiotics and amino acids in fish, which Ugh. is not good for the population. We were starting to do to fish what we've done to cows and chickens for you know, generations. So what we are now able to do is use insect worms as an input to the fish. Now, in the wild, fish already ingest 15% of all their ingestion is already insects. So all we're doing is returning them to the protein that they already use. So this Amazing. company um, went from having zero revenue to north of 100 million in bookings overnight. Wow. 
And they basically make little pellets that you can feed to fish because fish eat crickets already. And so we today we only grow worms. We are going to increase, but worms turned out like we tested a whole bunch of insect types, including things like crickets. The problem is when you grow them in close quarters, they become cannibals. So mm. you actually can't scale them. And what we do is we take the manure and we use the manure as an organic fertilizer. Uh, at maturation, we crush the worm. We take the liquid products and we sell it to the pet food industry to make kibbles more water soluble. And we take the dry cake powder as an input into fish meal. Amazing. Uh, when we look at SPACs, this is exciting. Um, I had one of my companies, Desktop Metals, going out by a SPAC. I had Rick Phillip on the pod. And I've got four or five other companies that, you know, I, I keep having SPAC promoters contact me about and say, hey, do you think Calm or do you think robin hood or thumbtack or whatever and I, was like, I, I don't know like you got to talk to them it's really not my place but uh you know we have half the number of publicly traded companies now my friend chamath uh is is piling up the spacs uh my friend mark pincus is piling up the spacs now apparently uh what impact will this have on our business you and i early stage investors um positive is it good is it bad positive and negative okay walk us through like most things in life yes um, so let's understand a basic fact, which is 20 years ago, successful companies, the best of the best, went public in a six to eight year time frame after being founded. And they were raising money when they were smaller and younger. And most of the appreciation, the gains that came for the company came in the public markets. Okay. So that was a net good for public investors. That was not necessarily a net good for venture capital. Now, the good thing for venture capital, the good thing for founders is we got liquidity earlier. And that's a positive, right? The bad thing is we didn't capture the 10x. So look at Uber. Mm. Like your net worth is dramatically increased because it stayed private for longer. If yeah, it was forced to hold. Yeah. yeah. And, and you may have chosen to be a public market investor, but, um, but being private for longer benefited people. So what happened was in the last 10 years, the best companies were staying private 11 to 13 years or longer. So what happened was money moved from the public markets into the private markets and funded them on a private basis. So capital availability meant they could stay private. They preferred to stay private because they didn't want to have to deal with the machinations of the public market and the vultures that are out there. Scrutiny. Yeah, the scrutiny and whatnot. Um, and so they stayed private longer. So people like Upfront Ventures benefited because our company stayed private and we were able to raise growth vehicles that could then invest in their private rounds. So all of the value capture happened in the private market. But generally speaking, I think it's a healthy outcome to get more companies public because, you know, as they say, whatever sunshine cures all wounds or yeah. whatever. Uh, I don't know what the exact sunshine is the best disinfectant. There you go. Thank you. Um, and, and I believe that. Sunlight. And so it will sunlight and it will um, lead to best outcomes when companies have more public scrutiny uh, of how they're operating and how the companies are doing. So I think generally it's good. I think so a bird's back coming or no? <laughs> Listen, we get a. There must be circling, right? The the SPAC people must be pinging you and saying, "Will Bird go SPAC?" I'd say every late stage company we have is getting circled. So that's a better way of saying. How it. would you frame it for a company like that? Would you want them to go public, or would you want them to say private and keep iterating? So for me, it's really more a question of access to capital, right? So if you need three to five hundred million dollars. Then you say to yourself, is that more available in the private markets or in the public markets? So in the last five to eight years, it was only available in the private markets. I mean, it was mostly available in the private markets. Now the, the pendulum has swung and there's a lot of money now in the SPAC industry. So a lot more companies are now having the discussion about whether they should use this as a fundraising event to solidify their market leadership position. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think, you know, I have been thinking about how long I'm having to hold some of these positions and I would like to have 20, 30% liquidity maybe. But that can be solved and is that is being solved in the private market. Yeah, slowly, slowly I'm having it happen. Yeah, yeah. And then you, I mean, just this a possibility of, you know, a great founder being able to use that public currency in a really intelligent way in the way Bezos did or Google did or Facebook did. I mean, they really use their equity in those cases to buy YouTube, Instagram, 
et cetera. And the best entrepreneurs will, because you have a premium if you do well in the public markets, and that premium allows you to acquire companies that don't have the premium. You know, that's the case of Google and YouTube. If Ring was still private in this SPAC era, they would have spac wouldn't they? Probably. Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, I would have, I would have loved that company to stay private, but I, I don't fault Jamie because Amazon is a great company and he's partnered with a great company. It worked out for Tony Shea. You know, it's one thing that uh, Bezos really gets, which I think the Google team learned later, which was just leave them independent. If it's working, don't break it. <laughs> Like, don't, you don't need to break a high functioning founder and culture at whether it's Zappos or YouTube or whatever it is, just let it sit over there and operate. Totally don't agree. Break um, so acquire companies that are already great at running themselves. The best of this week in startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com slash twist for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Fiverr, find the perfect freelance services for your business. Go to fiverr.com and use code TWIST to receive 10% off your first order. Masterclass, learn from the world's best minds. Anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. Get 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash startups. Trends by The Hustle. Track and capitalize on emerging industries and trends before they explode. Start your two-week trial for just $1 at trends.co slash twist. Gusto. Running a startup is hard work, but thankfully Gusto makes payroll easy. They also offer flexible benefits, onboarding, and so much more. Twist listeners get three months free at gusto.com slash twist. And Klaviyo is the e-commerce marketing platform that helps brands build relationships with memorable email and SMS messages. Today, more than 50,000 brands like Living Proof, Hint, and Chubbies choose Klaviyo to help them grow. Learn more and get started with a free trial at klaviyo.com slash twist. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash twist.